does. How's everybody doing? Come on, who's happy? Looking around, I want you to know you look good. I see Jesus on you. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and uh, ask him, have you lost weight? You look amazing. Come on. <laughs> want to give a shout out to those that are joining with us in downtown Loveland and downtown Greeley. We love you guys and are so glad that you are connected with us. Come on, Rez. Let's welcome everybody who's part of our church family. We're so glad that you guys are with us. And uh, before I get into this message, which of course is uh, part three of the Dreamers series, well, I, I'm actually going to revisit where uh, God spoke to Abram and gave him the vision of the, uh, of the dream and the vision that really resulted in the nation of Israel, salvation of the world. I mean, huge implications of this dream. So I want to uh, uh, drill down on that. But I want to give you guys a different uh, history lesson. You guys down for a quick little history lesson on something else? Come on. Come on, Greeley. Come on, Loveland. All right. Well, let's just see what this is just a lesson. This is random. I just chose at random to talk about this today. In a nod to Greek history, the first marathon... Oh, this is, this is the origination of the, and everybody loves a good origin story, right? The first marathon, come, yeah, okay, good. Uh, commemorated the run of, of the soldier. Gee, I, I wonder if I had only prepared, I would know how to pronounce this name, Phidippides, uh, from a battlefield near the town of Marathon, Greece, to Athens in 490 BC. According to the legend, Phidippides ran the approximately 25 miles. How many of you know it's 26.2 miles? Come on. Uh, to announce the defeat of the Persians to some anxious uh, Athenians, but not quite in the best shape. Oh, man. Uh, he, d he delivered the message victory and then he keeled over and died. I, I don't know if you know the origin story of the marathon, but uh, that was definitely weighing heavy on my mind at mile 16 when I couldn't do any more. I was pretty happy at mile zero. Uh, Sethry and I... Uh, started the race, you know, and, and of course it was the Disney Marathon and uh, so much fun. Fireworks at uh, five o'clock in the morning. There's just nothing else like it. And uh, anyway, so we, we, uh, we did that. Now, I'm going to tell you something <clears throat> I haven't, haven't said to a lot of people. Um, I actually, just a few weeks before the race, had a surgery and I hadn't told anybody about this. And so I had a surgery site on my back where they're swelling and some healing. <clears throat> so I've been having to wear compression stuff, which is why I've been wearing a lot of hoodies lately. And so <laughs> my doctor was so funny when I came back from the race a couple days later, he did a checkup with me and he said, hey, we're going to probably need to do some kind of stress test to see if you're healthy enough to, for me to give you the permission to do whatever you want to do, you know, day to day. I said, well, how's 16 miles? Is that good enough? And he's like, you passed the test. So good news, I don't have to do a stress test. Uh, <laughs> but, but what happened was as a result of that, I mean, about three or four o'clock in the afternoon, I'm just wiped out and I had some swelling stuff. So the morning of I made a dumb decision. I decided to wear a, sh a compression shirt and, and it was already so hot that day and so humid that they ended up cutting the marathon two miles shorter. Um, yeah, because they had so many medical events. And so I'm wearing this uh, shirt that, that behaved in some ways just like a sweater. <laughs> and so I was dying. So by mile 16, I had chills and fever and and I was a mess. In fact, 30 minutes after I sat down and stopped running, uh, my heart rate was still 125. And anyway, it was, it was crazy. And all I can, and I was so emotional. I get in this van and everybody on the van's in better shape than me, but I ran further than them. Come on. And uh, anyway, so I was the last one. So I, I get on this van and I just start crying. I don't know if you guys know, like the, the more fatigued you are, you get emotional. And in my adult life, I don't remember crying that hard. I just sat there just, it was so pathetic. You should be embarrassed to go to this church right now. <laughs> Uh, like the biggest wuss in history is your pastor. So I'm sitting on this, uh, in this air conditioned van, I'm crying. And, um, and that's when I texted that thing. I said, I failed, but Hey, 16 miles. And of course I've had a thousand of you lovingly rebuke me to my face. You did not fail. You succeeded. And, and it is true that my commitment to you was to do something that I have anxiety about. And that's to get into a big crush of people which I had never shared this story either, but I actually, when I was a young teenager, I got into a group of about a thousand people and some of the people there had been drinking and, and I actually was, a, I was in a dangerous situation in a big crowd and it actually affects me when I get out in front of, in, in large crowds of people. And so for the Dream Center and for church planting and for nothing without God, I said, hey, I'm gonna face my fear. If you guys will step up, I'll step up. And that's what I did. But just so you know, uh, I want you to get your money's worth. So I signed up for the Boulder Boulder. 
And that's only six miles. I'm pretty sure I can do that. But anyway, so that's coming up. And uh, so that's, that's my, <laughs> oh man. <sighs> Today's message is on faithfulness and focus, all right? And uh, we're going to revisit the story uh, of Abram. So what I want to do is go back to the verses we started the entire series on, reiterate them, and we'll unpack some of the journey from there. It says this, um, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. This is how we started the series a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago. Remember these three things that God says. First, do not be afraid. Listen, when God gives you a dream, and if you are breathing air, he surely will. When God gives you a dream, it's going to require courage, risk, and faith. Right? And we have to choose faith we have to, and, and, and love. The Bible says love casts out fear, and so we have to ch- reject fear or we'll never see those promises fulfilled, right? Then he says, hey, I am your shield. How many of you know when you start doing something that makes an impact in this world, the haters come? (coughs) The drive-by Facebook terrorists, right? Well-intentioned as I assume they are. Not really, right? And it's important for us to not be discouraged or distracted from the dream by the critics, So we let God be our defense, but we do warfare against the accuser when those criticisms come. What do you do, guys? First of all, you make sure you have people around you who can mentor you. In other words, they love you, but are not impressed by you, who can speak truth into your life. You need those people. You want to be a lifelong learner, but outside of that group of trust, when just the haters come, then what you do to do warfare is just keep telling, keep sharing the dream, keep sharing the testimony. Just be faithful because what you'll find is that the critics are not that powerful. So do not be afraid. I am your shield. Let God defend you. And then I am your very great reward. Ladies and gentlemen, God's going to give every one of us at least one dream, maybe multiple visions and dreams in our lifetime to pursue him in faith. But never, ever confuse the reward for being the fulfillment of the dream. The fulfillment of the dream is not your reward. In fact, if... If you think, man, whenever this happens, when my ship comes in, whenever I see that, that big dream come to fruition, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be so content. Well, maybe for five minutes until it's old news. But God's presence keeps getting richer and better. I want to encourage you today, start doing things that get better with time, not that we're thin over time. Come on, guys. And one of the things that gets better with time is a devotional life where you where you move toward intimacy with God. God is our reward. That's what heaven's about, by the way. It's being in in God's presence forever. That's the ultimate reward. Yes? All right, so he starts with this. He says these things. Now, Abram knows that something good is coming. He's been set up with the right mindset for a great promise. But before God even tells him the details of the vision, Abram responds. Of course, this is Abram, whose name would later be changed to Abraham. And then, of course, Sarah's name would be changed. So I'm going to start from here on out saying Abraham and Sarah. You guys okay with that? Doesn't matter if you're not, I'm going to do it anyway. So Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? Look at what he's going toward. He's immediately saying, hey, you can give me a lot of great things, but if I don't have a son, specifically a son, to inherit what you've given me, then, then what's it going to come to? Does that make sense to everybody? So he says, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, you, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him and said, this man will not be your heir. Okay, so Abram's expressed a concern and God is saying, hey, you haven't heard the dream yet. But a son who is your own flesh and blood, keep in mind this promise is not just for Abraham, it's for Sarah too. Your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And then God took Abraham outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars. You guys remember being a kid and and maybe a teacher said, hey, you ought to try to count the stars sometime mean teachers. No, I don't know. But anyway, I, I, I had someone say to me, you ought to try to count the stars one night. I was a little guy. And I remember I would like one, two, three, I lost my place. You know, it's like, it's just hard to do. You cannot count the stars. 
But he, God says, look up and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Don't miss this. Abraham is saying, I need a son. And God is saying, you're not thinking big enough. Because what you're going to get is a nation. Sometimes in our transactional living, God gives us the dream and all we can see is the son, which sons are important. I happen to be one. But God's saying, hey, if you just look further down, the, 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 the impact of that promise, that gift is a nation. And look at this. And Abraham believed the Lord and God credited it to Abraham as righteousness. That's big faith. Because God is saying, I know you want a son, but I'm gonna give you a nation. And the word of the Lord goes on. I'm not gonna take time today, but God gives Abraham, you know, have you ever heard of a five-year plan? God gives Abraham like an end of time plan. But one of the shortest parts of it was a 400-year promise. How many of you know Abraham didn't live to be 400 years old? All right. So God's like immediately saying, here's some things that are going to happen and it's going to be after you pass away. And so to have faith for something that goes, by the way, that is what legacy is. It's when you and I start adding value and resources and energy and faith to things that we'll never see in our lifetime. But when we go to heaven and become part of what the Bible calls a great cloud of witnesses, and then we get to see the next generation see the fulfillment of those dreams. This is modeled in the life of Abraham and God so valued it. He said, you know what? That's an act of righteousness. That's an act of faithfulness. All right, here's my question for you today. Was God promising Abraham a son or a nation? Someone to inherit his stuff or a promise that there would be a generation after generation sign of God's faithfulness in the nation of Israel and the Jewish people? All right, so which is it? Well, the answer is yes. But everybody look at me. But you won't know that if you're impatient. If you're just interested in what you can see in your lifetime or in the next week, you may see the son born. But can I tell you something? I'm interested in seeing the nation. In other words, I don't want to have a transactional mind. When God gives me a national vision and all I can see is the next transaction. Now listen, I'm not trying to say that a son is a transaction, but do you guys understand? God is the one who was correcting Abraham. He, he was saying, look, I know that you're concerned about this. I'm going to not only address your concerns, but now, now zoom out and see the bigger picture. You guys with me? Some of us get so concerned about things and God says, look, okay, I'm going to meet your needs, but I'm gonna do it according to my riches and glory, which means it's not just gonna meet your need. I'm gonna do something that makes a nation out of your life. Come on, guys. Man, I'm excited. If I'd run 10 more miles and finish that marathon, I'd been so tired I couldn't have preached good today. I quit for you. <laughs> Hebrews says this, we don't want you to become lazy, but to imitate those, this is so key, who through faith and what? Patience. Patience we're gonna focus on that today. Inherit what has been promised. Faith and patience. Whoa, we like to preach about faith because you got to have faith. But we don't like to talk about patience. It's just not fun. People don't shout amen when you talk about patience. I got an amen that people don't like. Anyway, don't worry about it. It's like a math problem. When I think of patience, I think of two things. If a person is kind of able to, to, to have faith in God, but also to endure in their faith, for that dream that God's given us. And listen, please understand this is a scripture written for you and for me. It says, we have got to learn how to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what's been promised. Sometimes it requires patient faith, enduring faith. Now, when I think of patience, I think of two things really primarily. One is over the long term, I remain faithful to God and faithful to the vision that God's given me. And over the long term, I keep my focus. Everybody hear this? Yes, on the dream, but primarily focus on the real reward, which is the presence of God every day. Faithfulness and focus. Faithful and focus. I really believe if you and I, over the long term, yes, it requires faith. Without faith, we can't even please God, but it requires endurance in believing. How many of you have had 
children or grandchildren that you have prayed, you have believed, but that faith that their lives will turn around and they'll come back to God or they'll be free of something that's harmful to them. How many of you know, sometimes it's not just faith, but it's endurance that is required to see the promises of God come to pass. And so the first idea, this first subset of patience, I think is when you remain faithful to something over the long term faithful to something. Now, if we go back to Abraham's story, we see in a, a moment where Abraham did believe God. He did believe that he and his wife were going to have a baby of their own flesh and blood, and the descendants would produce a nation as numerous, remember this, as the stars in the sky, right? You guys with me? All right, but now check out this part of their story. Turns out Abraham was a human. Yeah. So Sarah is a human too. And Sarah, as the years go by, she starts to be concerned. It was her promise too. And she's like, well, and I mean, look, who who can know except couples who have had a hard time for a period of time uh, having children, getting pregnant? Who can know except those couples, the kind of pain, the kind of challenge and trial that this brings? Okay. Uh, I, I'm convinced that Amy and I, uh, as long, if we kiss, as long as we keep our teeth together, she doesn't get pregnant. But other than that, it's like. <laughs> I'm not bragging or anything, guys. Uh, no, but I mean, but, but there are people that, <laughs> but there are people that have tried for years to have children. And what I'm trying to say is I've never been in that position, but I've seen the pain on the faces of moms and dads, of prospective moms and dads who just want to give give what they have to the next generation to love somebody like a mom loves a kid, like a father loves a kid. So I don't want to pick on this couple. They were going through something very real. They had this promise from God, but they also just wanted a family and couldn't have a family. So now you have a mom who wants a baby. And guys, I hope you're, you're okay with me saying this. And a husband who has a libido. So Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abraham, the Lord has kept me from having children. So, so she said, okay, God's doing this. And so she starts to figure out her own way. So Abraham, why don't you sleep with my slave? Perhaps I can build a family through her. You know, it's interesting, isn't it? Both uh, uh, Abraham and Sarah had had the opportunity to remain faithful to the vision in both of them because of different, um, very real concerns and anxieties, but still, but not looking to the vision as God gave it. It's like, hey, do you want to sleep with my slave? Abraham's like, yeah, I I do. (laughs) Like, what kind of church are we going to right now? (laughs) The guy doesn't finish marathons and he makes sex jokes in church. So... Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. And Abraham agreed. So after Abraham had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. And he slept with Hagar and she conceived. And the child that was born from that um, moment of unfaithfulness, if you will, was a kid named uh, Ishmael. Ishmael. It's interesting, so interesting. God had promised Abraham. You guys interested in this? Come on. God had promised Abraham children as numerous as the stars in the sky. But once Abraham slept with Hagar and Ishmael was conceived, God said this. He said, you're going to have children as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand in the sea. So now you have two lineages, if you will, these star people and these sand people, right? And I, this is not my characterization. This is the Bible. I'm, I, and it's, how many of you know it's a good career move for the preacher to actually use the Bible when he talks? All right. And so God is saying, okay, now you have two populations, both innumerable. Both will impact the world. And you can even see God's kindness to Hagar later in life when she's without. She's a single mom and God comes to her and is so faithful, so kind. How many of you know God loves every living person? Right. And there's a blessing. Please hear this on that entire, um, uh, not generation, but that entire ethnicity of people in the Middle East now because of Abraham. There's a blessing. There's a blessing on us because of Abraham. But here's something you need to know. In the Muslim faith, in their scriptures, they tell this story exactly the opposite. 
that Ishmael was the son of promise and Isaac was the illegitimate child. I want you to think about the implications of this moment. Now look, it's not Abraham and Sarah's fault that these implications are what they are. But can I tell you something? Abraham and Sarah probably, if they had just endured a little while longer, how different would the world be? I mean, I don't know. But I'm just trying to say, sometimes in our unfaithfulness, we create, we, we sow to the wind and God's saying, okay, the whirlwind is gonna come back. Can you guys hear this today? All right. So this is just a history lesson. Okay, the trials come. Patience is required. We don't always have the answers. And for different reasons, connected to our own insecurities or our own desires, we start to push ahead with our own strength and our own wisdom. And God's saying, look, if you'll just trust me, there's only room in this universe for one God. James says this, consider it pure joy my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. The testing of your faith, uh, staying faithful to what God said to you over the long haul in, in the face of discouragement, in the face of the circumstances you didn't expect, that it produces something called perseverance. And it goes on, so let perseverance finish its work. Perseverance has a job in your life. And even outside of church, management, leaders, talk, uh, uh, people that, that train leaders, they talk about something called grit. i tell you something, my prayer is that you get some grit in your soul, right? But that means you and I have to stand faithful over the long term through difficult circumstances. It's adversity over time if we stay faithful to what God's called us to do that produces grit in us. So let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything. Now, jumping back to the Older Testament of the Bible, uh, Proverbs makes a distinction, and I think it's an important one, between what the writer of Proverbs would call righteous people and wicked people. That language is, is not as useful to this particular teaching today because we're talking about enduring versus quitting, but the writer of Proverbs characterized it as wickedness versus righteousness. Look at this. It says that when the righteous fall seven times, they get up again. But the wicked stumble, the inference here is they stumble once and they don't get back up when calamity strikes. I think, I think this is useful, guys, that if you wanna keep moving ahead toward God's best for your life, then just understand the hits are gonna come, but instead of trying to fix it under your own strength, just stand up and be faithful to the vision that God's called you to be a part of. It requires faithfulness. This idea of faith and patience. Patience means faithful patience. The other part of it is focus. Again, I want to be as clear as I can. I'm not talking about focus relentlessly on the dream. That's part of it. But when the dream looks like it's coming to an end, never lose your focus on the face of God. Because I, I've, seen, I've seen people, and I've been tempted myself to despair when something doesn't go the way I hoped it would. And sometimes it's my focus, maybe too much of a focus on the dream as I'm watching it die, that actually pulls me away from my faith. You guys hearing me today? And how important is it for us to stay focused, not just on the dream, dreams may come and go, but on the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who never leaves us, who never forsakes us. In him, there is no shadow of turning. In him, there's no reason to lie. He's faithful, he's righteous, he's gracious, he's good. He's our reward. Here's another moment in Abraham's life. We looked at Hagar and Ishmael, the idea of faithfulness, how important it is. Because when we're unfaithful, sometimes we actually, we destroy ourselves. We hurt ourselves. We disqualify ourselves sometimes. And I'm grateful for grace, but I'm talking about in this earth. Consequences. You guys with me today? Sometimes when I, I finish a conversation with my father-in-law, maybe two out of three conversations, he'll say, hey, stay faithful. Don't disqualify yourself. He's been a pastor his whole life. I don't know if you know this, I'm a pastor. Stay faithful, don't disqualify yourself. I know exactly what he means. 
God will forgive me for anything I do. But can I tell you something? As long as I'm like, as long as my faith is in him and, but I got to tell you something. I, I, this is not, this is not my position. This is a privilege to be the pastor here. And I can forfeit that privilege. It's sobering. I think it's important for us to remember how important it is to be faithful. Because the dream might continue, but God might have another torchbearer to carry it forward because you and I have disqualified ourselves from the race. The Apostle Paul talks about, hey, I don't want to run as someone who runs aimlessly. I don't want to disqualify myself. So that's an important part, isn't it, guys? While I'm ranting, should I? No, nah, not going to do it. All right, let's keep going. We're going we're to stay focused. But I want to know. Yeah, I promise you don't. All right, back to Abraham's life. Sometime later, so this is after Ishmael is born, Isaac is now born. God tested Abraham. You guys know this story. And God said to him, Abraham. And Abraham says, here I am. And God says, take your son. Look at this, this is really interesting. Your only son. I don't want to get into much of this except to say, God only ever intended Isaac. Now, he blessed Ishmael. I think that's amazing how faithful God is. But he said, hey, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. There are a lot of difficult scriptures in the Old Testament. This is the hardest one for me. I almost don't even like to preach it because it's a tough, this is a tough moral dilemma. And, uh, but nevertheless, here it is. And God says, hey, you need to sacrifice your son. Now, what I take from this is God is saying, hey, your son and the future generations have somehow become your reward. And I need you to make that subordinate to your relationship with me again. That's the only way I can see this uh, uh, making sense. And so it was a test. And, and, and another thing, just so you know, is Isaac was never in any real danger. This was just a test of faith. But man, imagine Abraham's conflict, inner conflict. So he leads his son up to the mountain and he's preparing to sacrifice his dream to worship God. It's such just hard for me to relate to, but look at what happens. Abraham looked up from this place where he's about to sacrifice his son and there in a thicket, he saw a ram. How many of you know, mom and dad, how many of you know that's good news? How happy would Abraham be? He's not just seeing a ram, guys. He's seeing something that will take the place of his son. He's seeing an escape. He's seeing that God's provided a way out so that what God has provided will face death, but not his son. I think it's amazing. So he looked up in a thicket. He saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Theologians call this portion of scripture a Christophany because they believe that, uh, that Jesus was represented in that ram. Because if you look at what happened in the life of Jesus, what did he do except take our place on the altar? Jesus stepped up to the cross and he said, look, everyone, the wages of sin is death, the Bible says, but Jesus paid the price. He was that ram in the thicket. Boy, that, if I was a better preacher, I'd get you guys so happy about that idea. <laughs> I'm just a 16 mile one right now, but one day I'm gonna be a marathon preacher and you just won't even believe it. Come on. And... Um, Jesus was the ram in the thicket. He was the substitution for our sacrifice. It's amazing. And here you see it in the life of Abraham. So the, theologians say this was a, like a type of Christ or a revelation of Jesus in the Old Testament. And it must be, if, if not here, it's somewhere, because when Jesus walked the earth, there's a conversation he had with some religious nerds. And he said, your father Abraham, he says, Abraham, rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day and he saw it and was glad. What's he saying? The idea of seeing my day is a colloquialism in that time for he saw me alive. I saw him alive. Well, when did that happen? I mean, all I'm trying to tell you is Jesus said, man, there was a time <laughs> that Abraham saw me and he was so happy. He rejoiced. Well, when was that? I believe it was here. I believe it was that ram in the thicket. How happy would a dad be to see the ram in the thicket? Hey, and Jesus says, man, when your father Abraham saw me in his day, when he saw my day, 
He rejoiced to see me. Now look, these, these uh, religious leaders, they said, you're not even 50 years old. And you've seen Abraham. So they understood the meaning. He was saying, I saw the guy. Know him. We, ha- we hung out. Right? They're like, you're not even 50. So it was a clear co- uh, communication from Jesus. Jesus was saying, I met him. You guys talk about Abraham all the time, but I met the guy. That's what he's saying. And he was so happy to see me. I don't know, at least it satisfies my, uh, my mind that the time Abraham rejoiced to see the sacrificial substitution uh, was whenever Isaac, the promise was redeemed, was restored. My point is this. You see, Abraham didn't stay focused. I mean, his heart was broken because he was about to see the promise go away. Well, what redeemed the whole thing was when his eyes were turned toward the promise of Jesus, the promise of the substitution. I believe he was seeing heaven's provision. He was looking to God. That's what I mean when I say focus. A life coach can tell you to focus on your goals and it's important to do that. But as your spiritual life coach, I want to tell you to focus on God. No matter what happens. Because what happens, guys, is faithfulness over time and focus on God over time brings the nation out of the sun. It's like God, God promised me that I would start a business, right? It's like, hey, you add time to that, you be faithful, you stay focused on God, and what you'll find is that business that God promised you was just a vehicle to influence a whole group of people and their children and their children and to see a nation of influence because God blessed you with a business, right? Or God, God you know, God said he was gonna give me a song, I'm gonna write music. That's great. And, and, but but that's, that's the momentary promise, the influence you might have in the music community and then the future generations. It's all about people. But it requires faithfulness and focus. Faithfulness and focus. Everybody say faithfulness and focus. So what inspires faithfulness and focus for the long term, the long game? What does that? Because guys, I'm gonna tell you something. I've been tempted away from faithfulness. I've, been, I, I've moved toward despair when my focus on God was compromised. Maybe some of you have gone through something similar. And there are triggers. There are things that pull me away from that stuff. There are times whenever, I don't know if you've heard the halt, like with Alcoholics Anonymous, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. When we're hungry, angry, lonely, and tired, we make the worst decisions. We make decisions that are miles away from the calling and the dream God's put on us. Or when we get a setback, when when something happened that we did not see coming and it's a game changer and some of us just never Never get up again to keep going toward the, the goal that God's called us to do. Whatever it is, how do, you, how do you stay inspired to be faithful and to stay focused for the long term? I think four things. First, I'm not saying remember the dream. That's a huge part of it. Remember the story of how the dream came to you. Remember the story. Was it, was it a dream in the night? Was it an inspiration because you heard a sermon or you were at a conference or you had a friend who inspired you or a verse of scripture? Listen, hang on to the details of how God, God in his word, he didn't just say, I told Abraham he's gonna be the father of Israel. No, he said, man, there was some time that passed and Abraham fell into a sleep. And then I came to Abraham and I told him, hey, have courage and, and I'll be your shield and I'm your very great reward. And then he said to me, but I don't have a son yet to inherit all this stuff you're about to promise me. And I said to him, it's gonna be okay. Not only am I giving you a son, I'm giving you a nation as numerous as the stars. And the How many details are in that, guys? You and I really need to get better at storytelling (laughs) where we tell the stories, not just of the dream, we need to be able to cast that vision, but also when we talk about how God gave us the vision. And it was through a hospital visit with someone. Their last words were, my prayer for you is that you come to the end of your life without a hint of bitterness. And that impacted me the rest of my life. Or, or, Or going on a missions trip and seeing the suffering in this world and saying, you know what, in that moment, I determined I was gonna do something to make a difference. Never forget and rehearse and and tell your kids and anybody who listen to you, tell them the story of how the dream came to you. 
Because listen to me, in the details of your storytelling, you're setting culture. And as you and I are faithful to set culture, when we have those momentary lapses in judgment where we, we're about to choose unfaithfulness, sometimes that culture and the people around us can hold us in the center of God's will when we don't have the will to do it ourselves. Remember the story of the dream. Number two, you, you inspire your heart toward faithfulness and focus by looking for Jesus in the trial. You know where you can always find God? You can find Jesus in, in the scripture. You can, you, can get, you can dig into his thought processes. That's amazing to me. Uh, you can experience the presence of God in prayer. You can see the face of God in faithful friends. You know, the Bible says that, that one of the blessings is may God shine his face on you. So the idea is to project, like for you and me as believers that we, that we resemble Jesus to each other. How inspiring is that? Whenever you walk through those front doors and you see those greeters, my prayer is every time is that you see Jesus greeting you here. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like something about that. Not just people that are bored and half interested, but people whose hearts are there to understand, maybe praying for you like, man, I hope you have the best experience of your life. Jesus, seeing Jesus in the trial. Because the circumstances may, all, may be difficult, but there's always gonna be faithful friends around you. The word of God is always there and the spirit of God is as close as the air we breathe. So look for him. We stay inspired to faithfulness and focus by following the faithful example of other people. Just a couple of days ago, my grandmother, Madge Olean Wiggins, 90 years old, she passed away. And, oh man, and, and uh, she's an amazing person, a prayer warrior. And I remember one time, uh, my uncle, who had been a drug addict for decades, alcoholic, um, AIDS, um, just a junkie, and he, and he was... And he would rob my grandmother. He would go into her house and steal her things. And there was a point where it was so bad that she had a belt under her nightgown when she would sleep at night. And all her most valuable possessions, she'd put this belt around her waist and keep it on her body. Because my uncle would just rob her blind. And I was so angry. And she would just pray for Ronnie. I was just, Lord, I just lift up Ronnie. I'm like, Mama, how can you pray for Uncle Ronnie when he treats you that way? He needs to go to prison. And she said, Jonathan, you're not old enough to know this yet, which I love that. <laughs> Put me in my place, you know. <laughs> she said, but I've lived longer than you and I can tell you that no one in our family has ever died, even if it's on their deathbed, without first coming to Jesus. And my Uncle Ronnie had cancer in his face. They had to remove his jawbone. I mean, it was a horrible, horrible, his death. Well, my grandmother held his hand in his final hours and she prayed with him and he accepted Jesus into his heart. Can I tell you something? That is a legacy. So tomorrow I'll be celebrating her life in Louisiana. That's an example of faithfulness, of patience and inheriting the promise, right? And then finally, you can... Stay inspired toward faithfulness by celebrating the successes of other people along the way. Not every day is gonna be a victory day, right? And not every day, you're not always gonna come out in first place every day. But over the long term, if you're faithful and patient, you'll influence the next generation, you'll influence people around you. And sometimes we get this so twisted when other people, especially people that we've invested in, when they succeed, we get jealous or confused. Why not me? That is not God's mentality. God's mentality for us, his heart for us, is when we see people that we've poured into their lives and we see them succeed, we celebrate it. It builds us up, all right? This picture says a lot about the race. Here's me in the back, both feet are on the ground. By the way, running is when one foot's off the ground. <laughs> so this is me walking aggressively. And there's Seth three making it look easy. So I got to 16 miles and, uh, and Seth Ree runs faster than me. One of my favorite comments in all this was one of you guys, you were trying to help me with a strategy, which I probably should have listened to, uh, to finish the marathon. And you and said, are you running with anybody? I said, yeah, I'm running with Seth Ree Connor. He's like, that's great. He's got a runner's body. You don't. Favorite, favorite <laughs> comment. Love it. 
So anyway, he runs faster than me, but he stuck with me the whole time. So 16 miles in, I'm just depleted. I don't have anything else. I'm, I'm like, I'm starting to shake. And um, I said, hey, Seth, why don't you go ahead? He's like, no, I'm gonna stick with you till you're done, till, till you're absolutely finished. So I, that came and I looked at him. I said, dude, I can't do another step. And he put his arm, his hand on my shoulder. And he said, hey, cause he could tell I was taking it hard. He said, you didn't fail. You've done something great. And then he took off running like a gazelle. <laughs> and finished. Now, I told you that we cut the race two miles short. They cut the race two miles short for medical reasons. Um, so when Seth finished the race, he ran the rest of the miles to finish the 26.2 miles. He earned his uh, medal. And... So what's cool about this is he wouldn't have signed up if I hadn't have, have done this nothing without God thing. So when it was all over, I, I was crying, you know, and then I, we could track him and we saw that Seth refinished. So I texted him, I'm like, hey, don't let what happened with me diminish in any way. Like you, you finished, it was his first marathon. And he said, hey, I wouldn't have even signed up if you hadn't inspired me to. He said, I, I would have thought maybe I'm a few years away from being able to do this. And I cannot explain to you, something about that was so satisfying to me that I signed up for the Boulder Boulder, I'm gonna keep trying this and face those fears that I have, because they're real. But you have an associate lead pastor that actually ran the Disney Marathon for nothing without God and finished. And I think that's probably worth a little appreciation. And to celebrate the wins of the people around you is a way to stay inspired, yeah? When your kids succeed, when the people you've impacted for the kingdom of God succeed, when you see them have a win, even if you wanted that win to be yours, let it inspire you. Don't let it frustrate you. Stay faithful, stay focused on the face of God through everything, and you'll see a nation from a son. Amen? All right. Hope you guys are blessed by this message today. What I want to do is speak to a group of you that just in this atmosphere, in this moment, in the worship experience, and as I've been sharing, some, you've just been made aware. It's like, I, I'm not right with God, and I want to get right with God today. If that's you, I want to pray for you right where you sit. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way, but, but I would like to know who I'm praying for. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, if that's you and you'd say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to get right with God today. Would you raise your hand so I can see you? Yeah, God bless you, you, wow, it's awesome. In the back, you, entire row, wow. In the back, on the side, God bless you guys, yeah. Keep your hand up, just another moment. I wanna make sure, sir, I see you in the middle here. It's incredible. Okay, you can put your hands down. Yes, sir, I see your hand as well. That's amazing. What I wanna do is lead you in a prayer. In fact, I wanna ask every person under the sound of my voice to repeat this prayer after me. Say this with me, say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I have sinned and have lived life my own way and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In your name I pray, amen. God bless you guys. So good. Hey, listen, if you made that decision this morning, that decision to put your faith in Jesus to, to begin that process of saying, I want to be a follower of Jesus, if you just prayed with Pastor Jonathan right now, I want to just encourage you that that is an amazing just first step of a journey that God has for you. And we want to be praying for you in that process. We want to be um, just serving you in any way that we can. And I would love to know if you made that decision today. Pastor Jonathan wants to be praying for you by name this week. Uh, if you've made that decision, we just want to send you uh, what those next steps could look like. So there's two ways that you can do that. Earlier, we talked about that connection card in front of you. Would everyone just reach in front of you and grab that connection card out right now? I want to 
draw your attention to something. Uh, so go ahead and pull that out. And on the back side of it, you can say, today I'm making a decision. So if you made that decision, uh, leave your name, leave a way we can get in contact with you and just let us know you made that decision so we can be praying for you this week. Or you can text the word decided to the number that's on the screen. Just give us that opportunity to be praying for you. Uh, while you have that card out, I also wanna remind you that on the back side of it, uh, there's a section where you can write a prayer need that you have. If you're walking through something difficult in your life, we are a church family together and one of the teams that we have at Res serves you by praying for your needs every week. They read through every single one of those cards, pray for them individually. Um, and we just want to, uh, you to know that that's something that we would love to offer you as prayer. Uh, or if God's done something amazing in your life, we also wanna celebrate that with you. So also if you have something that God has done, write that, let us know so we can be celebrating with you. We would love to be able to do that. Uh, we are going to, in just a minute here, we're going to close our service with a time of giving. Uh, listen, if you're new to Res, if you're new uh, to this experience, you are under no obligation to be a part of this moment. But for those of us who call Res home, for those of us uh, who are followers of Jesus, uh, giving is just another way that we worship God. Jesus called, uh, talked about this in scripture, you see it throughout scripture, that we tithe, that's 10% of whatever we, uh, we, our income, we give that back to the church and that's a biblical thing that we do. So we'll give you that opportunity in just a second. There are three ways you can give at Res. You can go to PushPay uh, or use PushPay, which is by texting the word Res to the number 77977. I think this is the easiest way to give, and I set up recurring giving that way so I don't forget. Uh, or you can go to res.church slash giving online, or again, you can use that envelope that's in the seat back in front of you for that. Uh, I want to draw your attention to something which is that out in the living room this week, uh, this is Sanctity of Life Sunday. That is something that nationally is recognized for churches uh, this Sunday. So we want to recognize one of the great uh, f uh, uh, programs that we have in this area, which is Birthline of Loveland. And Birthline of Loveland uh, just offers choices and gives uh, resources to maybe young moms who are really pregnant or <laughs> young moms who are really pregnant or a little pregnant, any stage of pregnancy, they'll take care of you. Uh, they want to give you resources, give them options, give them counseling. Uh, they help with weddings and providing clothes for babies and all those things that can stress someone out that's in a really difficult situation. Give them some choices. So if you'd like to learn more about the services they offer, volunteer your time, connect with them in the living room today. And if you are new to Res, if you have not gone through Growth Track yet, that's going to happen right after this service. That is the front door of Res, and we would love to connect with you at Growth Track today. We're going to give you food. We'll take care of your kids during that, but Take that next step, go through that front door of res and just connect with us at that ne next level. We can give you information about that in the living room at the info desk. All right, well, it's been great just uh, worshiping with you guys today, growing with you. We're gonna just have a time of uh, worship for just a few more seconds, then you're gonna dismiss. I'm gonna invite the ushers and the prayer team to come forward as we pray. So Father, this morning as we give, we thank you that you have been so, so generous with us, God. So it's our heart just to give back to you cheerfully, God, knowing that you are good and that you're God, that you take care of us. So we give to you joyfully this morning. And I pray that as we go out this week, that we would be reminded of your nearness, that we would be reminded of that promise, God, and of what you have in the future, not just get stuck in the details of today, but that we would look forward to the things that you have for us in your life. We thank you for all the ways that you want to use us and everything that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. glad you're here this morning. If you need prayer for anything, we have an awesome prayer team up front. And if you would like communion, we have communion on both sides of the stage. Have a great week and we'll see you next weekend.